Welcome to Numerical Methods. So we are still in our uh, section on uh, random number generation, and we have seen yeah, the very nice, interesting Coxma Lafka inequality that now gives us um, a pointwise estimate of our Monte Carlo integral, yeah, of our Monte Carlo approximation here, and uh, the true integral here. So no longer in probability, yeah. So not with the p, and also here in arbitrary dimensions. So that's the unit cube to the power of d, and we could estimate it by two terms. Yeah. So the first terms was was here the variation of the function. Yeah. So how how much how volatile is the function? So that corresponded maybe to the fourth derivatives in the Simpsons rule, yeah, or the variance in the stochastic Monte Carlo estimate. And then there was the discrepancy, a measure that tells us how well distributed, how equally distributed the sequence yeah, x1 up to xn is. And this motivated now the search for low discrepancy uh, sequences. So let me give a small recapitulation. So, so if you uh, look at our uh, Monte Carlo approximation, of course, a low discrepancy sequence, yeah, which we already guessed and which we already checked out, was just use evenly spaced points. So that is then equivalent to performing a Riemann sum. And um, indeed, this uh, evenly spaced uh, sequence gives us a convergence rate that is better than what you have from the stochastic result because the discrepancy of this sequence is 1 divided by n, as you can easily check, yeah, which gives us a convergence rate now one divided by n, order one divided by n, and the stochastic result had one divided by square root of n. So however, there is a disadvantage here. We have to recreate this evenly spaced partitioning, you know, this sequence uh, for any new n. So if you just add a new point yeah, then actually you have a completely different sequence Yeah, if you move from n to n plus 1. So our aim is actually to have an infinite sequence such that every subsequence has low discrepancy. Okay, and there is a nice sequence that has this property, and you can also show that uh, its discrepancy is, in a certain sense, optimal. And that's the van der Korput sequence. So here's the definition of the van der Korput sequence. We have a parameter, the base. So there is a parameter, the base B. So B is a natural number larger than one, yeah? so two, three, four, or whatever. And then the van der Korput sequence xi with base b is defined as follows. So xi is the sum j from 1 to infinity alpha ij b to the power of minus j. So that's 1 divided by b to the power of j. Okay, so that looks strange, yeah? Of course, it also looks strange because it is an infinite sum. Yeah? But yeah, just think you would always sum up 1 divided by b to the power of j. So you see, actually, even if it would be infinite, it would be bounded, yeah? It would, be, it would stay below 1. Uh, but in fact, it is a finite sum because now we define the alpha ij which are in the set from 0 to b minus 1, by encoding the index i with respect to the base b. 
So the index i is the sum j from one to infinity, alpha i j b to the power of j minus one. Yeah, okay, j minus one. So we start with b to the power of zero. So, so this means if you consider, for example, the case uh, b equals two, yeah, this here is the binary representation of the index. Um, yeah, how do you find these alpha ij's? Yeah, maybe that's uh, a good uh, remark because now I would like to implement uh, this uh, sequence. Yeah, you can find this by taking the index i and uh, checking if the index i is divisible by two. So you take the remainder yeah. And that actually gives you the least significant, so the smallest bit, yeah? Yeah, so least significant means it is the smallest j. Okay, and then you have extracted this, and then you divide by b, yeah, so by the... Um, uh, base again, so in that case uh, by two, yeah? so you shift all the bit, you forget about the remainder, and you do that again. So that would be a method to find these alpha ij's. So if you have then found these alpha ij's, you can construct this xi yeah, by taking now the fractional representation. So if uh, the first alpha ij, the alpha i1, yeah, uh, is equal to, say, 1. Yeah? If we are in base 2, it is 0 or 1. Then we add 1 half, and then the next bit is checked. OK, we add 1 over 4. The next bit is checked. We either add uh, or not 1 over 8, and so on. So you see that this here is uh, a finite uh, sequence. Because yeah, at a certain point, the b to the power of j minus 1 is larger than the index. So that's maybe also a nice remark, which I like to add. Yeah, at a certain point, the b to the power of j minus 1 is larger than the index. So there is a k that b to the power of k is larger than the index. OK, let's take the logarithm on both sides. So I have log i is smaller than k times log b. OK, and then we have that log i divided by log b smaller than k. Yeah, so for... Um, or the j yeah, being larger than log i divided by log b, all the uh, alpha ij's are zero. Yeah? So the alpha i k is identical zero for k larger than log i divided by log b. Okay, so here is the example for uh, base two. So you take the binary uh, representation for the index, so for example, if the index one uh, occurs, the first index, then I have one times one to represent this. Yeah, so the first bit here is a one, and then I take one times one half is then the value um, of the sequence. Yeah, so my alpha i j here is. So, so I have alpha ij times 1 divided by 2 to the power of 1. Yeah, All the other alpha ij's are 0. So my first point is then 1 half. So I place it here. So then this uh, continues. Yeah, 2 is 1 times 2 plus 0 times 1. Yeah, so but now the 2 corresponds here to the 1 over 4. So I have 1 times 1 over 4 plus 0 times 1 
half, so it's one over four. And now the three is one times two plus one times one. So now the two corresponds to the one over four and the one corresponds to the one over two. So I have three over four, I place this point here and I get step-by-step step a nice refinement of this interval from zero to one. Okay, so let's start and implement this uh, method and let's have a look how the series looks like. Yeah, we, while we are doing a programming session, I also like to teach you a few aspects uh, from programming. And one really very important aspect is that we should use interfaces because interfaces really make our design much cleaner. We can reuse code in many different places. And you already learned about this. Yeah, so for example, we had here an interface integrator in our Monte Carlo method, yeah, that just told us, okay, this is what an integrator can do. It can integrate a function. And then we implemented this function in different ways, yeah, the Monte Carlo method, the Simpsons rule, yeah, our yeah, evenly spaced points. And the nice thing was that when we like to test this integrator, yeah, I could write one method to test an arbitrary integrator and perform integrations with different integrators. And this code here doesn't know which integrator he is using because the only thing he knows is that he has some implementation that provides this function. Yeah, So we can provide a function in different forms in different inter implementations using interfaces. And I would also like to do this now for my random number generator. So let's have a new uh, package. So I create here the package random numbers and there should go now our code on random numbers. And the first step, I would like to create an interface that yeah, has some abstraction what our random number generator does yeah so this is a new interface and i call it random number generator 1d because it is just a sequence in uh, one dimension yeah we will later generalize this to higher dimensions and this interface just has a single function uh, it has the function that gives me the next element from the sequence. So let's call that maybe next double because the value that we get is um, a floating point double precision number. So um, this is now my interface and I would like to implement now the von der Korput sequence as a sequence that implements this interface. So let's do this. So I create a class. So my class is now called van der Korput sequence. And this class should implement my interface. So I write here, implements random number generator 1D. Yeah, now he complains, okay, you claim that you implement this interface, but there is no such implementation here. So let's at this implementation. So here Eclipse helps me and provides a stop implementation. So that's what he can guess. Uh, but of course, I do not like to return a zero. I would like to return the van der Korput uh, number here. Yeah. yeah, the van der Korput number has um, a nice property. If you think back to, uh, and think about our pseudo random number generator, there it was that the next value is a function of the previous value. Yeah, we were always say turning this wheel of fortune. Yeah, it was always a plus the previous value plus c modulus some large number m. Uh, here for the van der Korput sequence, we have that x i is just a function of i. So you have some kind of random access. Yeah, I can calculate x1000 before I have calculated x500 or so. This is actually a very nice feature of a sequence that you can start at any later point. Yeah, some sequences do not have this property. It's it's a feature. So um, because I can just calculate this 
element, yeah, just by knowing the index, let's just provide it as a static uh, function. So in case somebody likes to use that. Uh, so I create here a, a function and I call it, say, get, get van der Korput number. And now I would like to have that number for a given index and a given base. Yeah? So I could use integers here or I could use long integers. That's not the point, yeah? So maybe I use long. Um, I'm a programmer, yeah? So I would like to have the starting point of the index in zero. So the index is x0, x1, and so on. But if you look here in the formula, the index here starts in one. So um, the first thing is I have to uh, correct the index. So the index provided here The index provided here should start in zero. Huh? So let's add some documentation. Dummy, dummy documentation. So the first thing is if the index starts in zero, but the formula requires it to start in one, yeah, let's uh, increment the index. Okay, so and now how do we proceed? I mentioned that I can extract the question, do I have to add one half or not? by taking the, the remainder of the division by two, yeah? So if you look to the table that we have, okay, so you see if it is an odd number, yeah, then you have a one times one standing here. And exactly then you add also the one half, yeah? So this is always alternating. Adding one over four is then also alternating, yeah, but actually here in blocks over two. Yeah. So that's the um, other remainders. Um, so I can check the remainder by uh, checking if I can divide the index by two. So since I'm... So that's actually the remainder. And if this remainder yeah, is now zero or one, then I uh, multiply it with one half. Yeah? So actually this one half is actually now one divided by B. And the remainder that I check is the remainder with respect to the base. So let's call this here um, the say refinement factor. And let's define it, the refinement factor is one divided by base. So if I start, it will be one divided by two if I have base two, and then I check this. So that's actually my um, x. So let's initialize my x to zero. And of course, I have to add many such parts here. So that's just this first element of my sum. So how long am I summing? Yeah, I have to do this here now for, say, the two to the power of zero. That's actually the one, the two to the power of uh, one. Yeah? So I have to check this for uh, many such things. And I uh, will stop when the index is rounded to zero. So as long as the index is larger than one, I do this. And then I divide my index by base. So this is index is equal to index divided by base. So maybe you can also write this out if you are more familiar with this. Yeah. Okay. And then you move to the next index. Yeah. So for example, uh, if the index is three, yeah, you check, okay, the index is larger than zero, yeah, three divided by two has a remainder one. So yes, you add one half. Okay, then you divide three by two, uh, which will give you a one. Uh, so then you check the one again, uh, and one divided by two has a remainder. Okay, so you have to add the one over four. So we have to um, refine the refinement factor. 
the one over four. So the refinement factor is now the ref previous refinement factor divided by base. Yeah, that should be the algorithm that calculates the van der Korput sequence. Yeah? So um, again, yeah, index is three. Three divided by two yeah, has a remainder one. Yeah, so one times one half, the first one is one half, adds the one half. Then I divide the index by two. Yeah? So this is integer division. Yeah? So integer division. So dividing by two is one, one times two, plus remainder one. But uh, the remainder is thrown away. Yeah? So this is just one. So next, next index I check is just one. And my refinement factor has moved to one over four. Let's check if this works. So I return the X. Um, maybe I should first check if this works here. Let's create here a small main method. Yeah, maybe not the best style to create that here, but it's just very small. And let's print maybe the first yeah, 10 van der Korput numbers for um, a certain base. Yeah, So let's say we have base two and uh, I create a small loop. And I just print now the first 10 numbers. So I print now the get van der Korput number for my I and my base. So let's run this little main method we have implemented there. Okay, so, and you see that looks correct, yeah? So for index zero, yeah, I move my index to one. Yeah, I enter this loop just once and I add one over two. For index being one, yeah, I shift my index to two. So then my index is two. So the first thing is two divided by two is zero. Yeah? So the one over two will not be added. Then I divide my index by two, yeah? it's a one. So I enter this loop here again, but now with a refinement factor being one over four, one divided by two is a one, okay. And I add the one over four. And then there's the three, which gives me a three over four. And then we go to one over eight, yeah? 1 over 8 plus 1 over 2, yeah? and uh, so on. So you see that the trick here is that, you go back here, the trick is here that you have the binary representation of the index. Yeah? So say if I have the least significant bit to the right, yeah, yeah, yes, you sometimes usually have. So maybe this here is now my index represented. Yeah? So this here would be a one, a two, a four, an eight. Yeah, so actually this is the index nine, which you have here. Yeah, then you check for this bit by doing this division with the remainder. Yeah, so this here is the remainder. And then you shift everything to the right and you continue with th this part. Yeah, and you then check the remainder, remainder again and so on. Yeah, and a very nice, uh, very nice algorithm that gives us now our van der Korput sequence. Uh, I'm not done with my uh, small implementation here because I would like to implement here my interface. Yeah, So I would like to have an interface that gives me the sequence one after the other such that I can use it later in my Monte Carlo integrator. Yeah, let's complete this. So to complete this, yeah, my class has a property that is the base. So let's define this property. And then my class should have some kind of counter, uh, some kind of state. Where is the index currently? So what is the next index I would like to provide? So let's also maybe provide this uh, counter here. And now 
yeah, you would say, okay, the counter is maybe an integer, yeah, or also a long or whatever. Um, now I do something a bit um, special. I use not a long here. Yeah? So maybe I use first a long and then I change it. So maybe I initialize that one to zero. So my, my sequence starts in zero. And um, now uh, I need a constructor to construct this object from that class. So here Eclipse can help me and he can do that for me. So generate a constructor using the fields. So the field base is missing. So I can create now an object representing my Fanda Corpus sequence. The counter is initialized already to zero. Uh, maybe I first check that the base is valid because if you go back to our slide, you see that the B yeah, has to be larger larger than one. So I do that a little bit clean here. Yeah? So if B, yeah, say, is smaller or equal one, then we print an illegal argument um, exception that the base should be larger than one. So we, we check this, this, this space here. Yeah, now I have um, a constructor, so I can implement now my next double. So my next double is now uh, get van der Korput number at my current value of the counter and at the base. Yeah, so that is actually my value. So then I have calculated my value, then I can increment the counter. Okay, it should not be final for that, yeah? Otherwise, I could not change it. <laughs> okay, and um, then I return the value. Okay, so that would give me now, yeah, one one element after um, the other. Yeah? So you could also just maybe uh, change here now our little test, yeah? So I could now create here an object so let's create here a new van der Korput sequence with base two. And then here, instead of just asking always for the element i, yeah, I could just ask, okay, give me the next element. So let's run that again. And you see that hopefully we get the same things. Yeah. So now you have a sequence where you can ask, okay, give me the next number. Um, yeah, the reason why I placed here the final, actually, uh, there is a small issue which we will maybe see uh, later if you do it like this, because this implementation here is not thread safe, which means if you have now multiple threads yeah, running in parallel, you know, so parallel computing, and that are calling this method in parallel, then you see that it could be that two guys in parallel enter into this function and they ask for the same number. Uh, because this here is one operation. And then after that number has been calculated, there comes the plus plus. But it could be that the other one has already entered here. So I would like to make this uh, thread safe. And that's also something I like to teach you. Yeah? Uh, I mean, if you like to do multi-threading and Monte Carlo method is really a method which is, yeah, it's embarrassingly parallel, yeah? which is uh, very easily uh, to be parallelized, then you should be aware of these things. Yeah? And I would like to teach you a little bit these things too. So what you can do is there is some thing that is called an atomic integer, yeah, an atomic integer, or also an atomic long. And this atomic long is now a counter that can be incremented and get it uh, in an atomic operation. So I create here my new atomic long and I initialize it to uh, zero. So now what I do here, I um, first ask for what is the current index. So I first ask here for what is the current index. So my counter should get me 
get me the current index and automatically increment this. And then I can use this index in my Funda corporate sequence. So this ensures that I calculate each Funda corporate sequence number only once yeah, for every call to this uh, function. So if I now like to distributedly calculate partial sums, if you like to get partial sums, it is ensured yeah, that each partial uh, sums has different uh, values. Yeah, now I like to use my Funda corporate sequence in my Monte Carlo integration. So I move back to my previous chapter and I go to Monte Carlo integration. And if you take a look at what we have done here, yeah, so there is our little experiment where we integrate the function cosine x yeah, from 0 to 5. We have used different integrators, yeah, for example, our Monte Carlo integrator. And our Monte Carlo integrator just used a uniform random number sequence. Yeah. The uniform random number sequence was just a, a class, an object that implemented the interface double supplier. So our double supply interface is very similar to the interface random number generator. It just has a single function that returns now a floating point number. Okay. The only uh, little drawback is that this uh, method here has a different name. So what do you do if this has a different name? Yeah, you can just go to your interface random number generator, and you can also say that this interface also yeah um, yeah and, and uh, wraps yeah also um, conforms to the interface double supplier. So I can write here that this extends the double supplier interface, um, and. Now, if you go back to the Funda corporate sequence, you see that here he is complaining. He says, okay, this guy should now implement random number generator, but random number generator has a method that is called next double, but it also has the double supplier interface, which requires a method that it call, is called get s double. So that would be a bit cumbersome if you have to implement always the two names. So what you can, of course, do is you can just tell him a random number generator is something that implements this interface next double, but it can serve as um, a double supplier, and the double supplier is just supplying the same function. So now um, I just add here the the function that the double supplier is expected to see and just tell him, okay, this is just the same as use next double. Yeah, now my Funda corporate sequence is um, a random number generator 1D that can be used here in our Monte Carlo integrator because my Funda corporate sequence conforms to this interface. Yeah, now I would like to do Monte Carlo integration with this sequence. So you should maybe implement now a quasi Monte Carlo integrator using Funda corporate, but actually there's nothing to do yeah, because we have used uh, the interfaces. So I can just move to our little experiment. So that's our experiment where we integrate here the cosine. So what we had is we had Simpson's rule. We have had the Mersenne twister. We had this little guy here. And now uh, let's do the Monte Carlo integration with the Funda corporate sequence. So I can write double supplier yeah, under corporate sequence. I have a new Funda corporate sequence with base two. And I can now use now here my Monte Carlo integrator, but instead of using my 
Mersenne Twister sequence, I use the van der Korput sequence. So let's call this integrator Monte Carlo, say, van der Korput. And I can test this guy. So let's run now our program with the four different ways of performing integration. Okay, so you see my Simpsons integrator, I use one, two, three, four, yeah, 10 to the power of four points. Yeah, I have a 10 to the minus 16, four times four, um, error for the Simpsons integration. My Monte Carlo integrator has a 10 to the minus two, yeah, four divided by two, the square root of the 10 to the minus four um, error. Uh, this was where we evenly spaced the points, yeah, but it, was, but it was not an infinite sequence. And this here is now my um, van der Korput, van der Korput sequence. You see that I print here the name of the class and I'm just using the Monte Carlo integrator with the van der, van der Korput sequence. So I do not see that actually this is um, a different, yeah, different implementation that is used here. Uh, if you like to see this, yeah, and maybe that's also something that I like to teach you, there is an easy trick. Yeah. Um, so you do not need to know uh, which class is uh, pushed in here, the class. So here I'm printing the class, but you can also just ask for print the object. Yeah? And if you just place the object here, print integrator, then yeah, what is he doing? He is printing the fully qualified name, very ugly. Also here with the address where this object resides in the memory to some extent. And what is happening here is that he's calling the method toString of the corresponding class. But now you say, okay, there is no method toString here. Okay, he is calling the default implementation, but you can provide your own. And that's a nice little thing if you would have such a nice printout. So you can also ask Eclipse here for help, generate two string for me. So in this two string method, you can say what are the fields you would like to print. Yeah? So um, I would like to have the number of evaluation points, maybe that's nice, and the random number generator that was used, our double supplier that was used. So then he will generate some string. And now if you run the program again, you see that he's now printing this string here. So now you see that here he is using the van der Korput sequence. Actually, I see he's using the implementation here from my library, yeah, which is compatible, but uh, I would like to have not that implementation here. I would like to have maybe our implementation. So maybe I import our implementation, the one that we have created here in the lecture. Huh? So now you see he has used that implementation and let's run again. Yeah, now he used uses the implementation that we use here in the lecture. Um, yeah, here he is also printing the fully qualified class name, including the address. Maybe we also add a two-string method to our van der Korput sequence. So we have a nice printout in our van der Korput sequence. So generate two string. So what do we like to see? Yeah, maybe we like to see the base. Yeah, maybe we don't like to see the current, current counter. Yeah, that's your choice maybe. And now if you print it, you see that I'm using the Monte Carlo integrator 1D with that many points and the Van der Korput sequence. And here I'm using the Monte Carlo integrator 1D with that many points and the Mersenne twister yeah, with a certain seat. So you can also maybe improve the printout for the Simpsons integrator. Yeah, so add also here a two string method with the number of evaluation points. And that guy here, yeah, okay. Maybe we also 
add a two string method to that guy. So our printout is now a bit nicer. So I go back to my um, experiment and maybe I need a little bit more space here. Even more. Okay, and I have now a ni much nicer output. So you see the interesting thing is that you can use now, you, re you reuse your Monte Carlo integrator code. Yeah, you can reuse it with different generators for this uniform sequence, the Fanta Corput or the Mersenne. Yeah? And all because we use these nice interfaces. Yeah, So this here is a general integration using just an arbitrary integrator, but also now our integrator, the Monte Carlo integrator, can use many different generators for this sequence. And my Monte, my van der Korput sequence is just one possible su such generator. Okay, the star discrepancy of the Fanta Corput sequence is log n divided by n. Um, yeah, actually, if you have a Fanta Corput sequence base two, if the number n of points you generate is some two to the power of k, then you actually have an evenly spaced. Uh, um, uh, partitioning of the interval. Then actually you have a one divided by n. The point is that in between, yeah, you lose a little bit of this convergence order because as you fill the gaps, yeah, you don't reach the next uh, level in say some some, some smooth way. So we have this uh, term log n here. But this is, of course, better than the one divided by square root of n. Uh, do we see this log n divided by n in our experiment? Maybe we go back to our experiment. Yeah, you see that my van der Korput sequence has a one, yeah, a one divided by n. My n was a 10 to the power of four. Uh, I have approximately a one divided by n. I don't see the effect of the log. Yeah? If you like to now make the number of in integration points here larger, yeah, let's move to a 10 to the power of six. Okay, then you see a one divided by 10 to the power of six for the um, guy that uses the van der Koppel sequence. For the guy with the Mersenne twister, it's indeed the square root. It's a, it's a 10 to the power of minus three. This uh, log n divided by n, actually this, this matches the best order yeah, possible for one dimensional um, infinite sequence. So there are nice properties now. So we have indeed an infinite sequence that has low discrepancy, better than Monte Carlo. Another nice property is that we can generate the sequence for any given sub-interval of the index set. Yeah. So if you'd like to now calculate an integral in parallel, yeah, you could say maybe, okay, you start with index zero and go up to 900. 99, and the next one starts with index 1000 and uh, goes to um, 1999, and so on. You can do it in parallel. So that's um, an, a nice uh, feature. So this allows us to parallelize the uh, integration algorithm on, a, for example, a multi-core machine. Yeah, coding session, implement the Fanta Corput sequence. We did this use an interface for this. Yeah, we did this. Yeah. Let your interface also implement the double supplier such that you can use it as a quasi Monte Carlo integration. Yeah. And the nice thing is there was actually 
nothing to do here because we could reuse our Monte Carlo integrator 1D and just plug this in, yeah, because it implements the right uh, interface. As always, you can find this here in our lecture repository and yeah, repeat all the experiments um, at home if you like. So here is another uh, yeah, small experiment related to the fact that we now have an infinite sequence and yeah, I don't want to do the live coding. Maybe we just step shortly through it. So there is a Monte Carlo integration experiment here, yeah, actually in this package. And what I like to do here is I would like to calculate, say, the integral of this function here Yeah, x to the power of three. So this is a function that has maybe its largest variability here in the region where you get close to one. Yeah. But now I would like to use three different ways of yeah, populating the interval. So the first way is that I just use the linear concurrential generator, the Mersenne twister. So I place points just randomly and I'm do some kind of refinement, yeah, like that. The second thing is that I would like to use an equipartitioning. So I make the refinement from left to right and I just fill the points, yeah. And the next guy is that I use the van der Korput sequence, so the van der Korput sequence would do the refinement in a special order. Yeah, so one half, one over four, three over four, yeah? then one over eight. And I would like to see how the integral approaches yeah, the correct solution as you use larger and larger subsequences. So I would like to perform the Monte Carlo integration now for a subsequence x1 to xm, yeah, where m runs from 1 to n. Yeah, and note that here I'm using the equipartitioning, but I'm filling from left to right. Yeah, so you see how the convergence rate uh, evolves. So if you like to look at this, you go to this package here, Monte Carlo integration 1D. Yeah, so that's here in our lecture repository. You find many different things. So there are Monte Carlo integration 1D. So there's this guy. So we take um, the function x to the power of three. The uh, analytic solution yeah, is uh, one divided by four x to the power of four from zero to one is One divided by four. I take here 10,000, no, 100,000 evaluation points, and I use some Mersenne twister. And what I do is I run now from zero to n, and I take the Monte Carlo sum yeah, or the integral sum. So, but then I calculate the integral so far. Yeah. So the integral so far is take my sum and divide by the number of points that you have used so far. Since the index i starts here in zero, the number of points that I have used so far is just the i plus plus one. So that's the integral so far. Take the sum and divide by the number of points that you have used so far and then print the error. Let's uh, run this little guy. Okay, and I print here, yeah, every 100 sample points, I print some output. And yeah, you see that you have some kind of convergence rate. So the Mersenne twister starts here at uh, a 10 to the minus two. You would maybe expect a 10 to the minus one, yeah, because I have 10 to the power of two points, yeah. That also a 10 to the power of two. Yeah, if you move to 10 to the power of three, this guy is suddenly surprisingly good, but it's just random. Yeah? If you would use a different seed, you would maybe get a different error. Yeah? So this guy is good by chance. Yeah. So this guy has moved to the 10 to the minus three as we expect. 
So then maybe we will move to say something around 10,000, yeah? 10,000, yeah? One, two, three, four, yeah? So this guy here should be theoretical at a 10 to the minus two. It's a little bit better, yeah? It's a 10 to the minus four, yeah? Times four, so it's better. Um, so this guy here has moved to the 10 to the minus four. You see, this guy becomes worse, yeah? So it is now at a 10 to the minus three. So it's random. Here you get better. And if we then approach the 100,000, okay, indeed, yeah, we end up to be at a 10 to the minus three. So this is a 10 to the power of five, yeah? So I would expect a 10 to the power of minus 2.5. I'm a little bit better at 10 to the minus three. And this guy is at a 10 to the minus five. So what do you see now if you fill evenly from left to right? Yeah, of course you have always very large errors. Yeah, And you see absolutely no convergence. There's absolutely no convergence up to say the very end. And the reason is because the function has its variability in this region that we are filling at the very end. Yeah. Okay, this is maybe a no-brainer, but you see that having an infinite sequence that is continuously filling the space yeah, is really, uh, really an advantage. And you see that here you have uh, this, this problem. So that was it for the uh, one-dimensional low discrepancy sequences. What do we do if we do the sequence now in higher dimension? So I would like to look at low discrepancy sequences at higher dimension. And recall that we had an algorithm that allowed us to create a higher dimensional sequence out of a lower dimensional sequence. Maybe I find this. So that was here, yeah. So remember this algorithm. We populate the vector by just populating component by component, element-wise. We populate the vector element-wise. So the first element of the one-dimensional sequence populates the first element, the first of the first vector um, of the two-dimensional sequence and uh, so on. Yeah? So you populate the vector um, element-wise. Let's implement this. That creates a general d-dimensional random number generator out of a one-dimensional generator. So, uh, yeah, I have my interface for the one-dimensional generator. Maybe I would like to have an interface for a general random number generator. So let's create a new interface. So this is now the random number generator. And what do I need from such a generator? Well, now I need the next vector. So that's now a double vector. So this is, say, maybe get next, get the next element of this. And maybe I also need to know the dimension of this generator. Uh, before I start, yeah. So there should be maybe also a method get dimension. That tells me, yeah, am I in two, three, or what dimensions? And now I would like to create some wrapper that can create an n-dimensional generator from any one-dimensional generator using this little trick here. So this class, yeah, maybe we call it random number generator from, yeah, say, random number generator 1D. Yeah, so that's maybe a long name, but it's a correct name. Create one implementation out of another implementation. If you would like to shorten it a little bit, you could also just say from 1D. Yeah? Maybe I like the other one better, but we could go like that. So this guy should now implement the interface 
random number generator by consuming a random number generator 1D. Okay, so it has as a field, yeah, as a property, this one-dimensional generator. Another property is, of course, which dimension should he generate? Should he generate a two-dimensional vector or should he generate a three-dimensional vector? So let's also have a property of this implementation that knows the dimension. Yeah, let's create a constructor. that consumes those two properties and creates this object. And then he's still complaining here. Yeah, he's complaining because I must implement my two methods, yeah? the next vector and the dimension. Okay, the dimension is now easy. Yeah, It is just the property that has been used to initialize this object. And now I, yeah, I implement this algorithm here. So how do we implement this algorithm? Yeah, I allocate the vector that I would like to return. So this is a new vector of dimension, dimension, and then I populate it. Yeah? So I populate it. So my loop runs from i to, from i being zero to less than dimension. Yeah. And I now populate this vector. So the i's value of this vector is, yeah, now I ask my one-dimensional generator, give me the next number. And I have populated this vector. Yeah, very nice. Now I have implemented this algorithm that we have discussed yeah, a long time ago, yeah, how we generate vector sequences out of one dimension sequence. And I can use it for all my uh, random number generators. Mm, maybe sometimes it's not a good idea and we have to uh, check this. Um, before I do this, maybe a small remark. Yeah, If you would like to be thread safe here and really uh, ensure that always the same part of the one dimensional sequence is used, then you maybe have to synchronize this here. So you have to plug concurrent, yeah, simultaneous access to this part. Yeah? If you like to do this, yeah, you can just um, write here synchronized and then you have to provide which object is performing the log. Yeah? So we could maybe say here access to the random number generator should be synchronized. Maybe we have to Sometimes this is not a good idea because you should use your own log, yeah? but maybe for this demo it's enough. Um, so this means now that this part here is not performed in parallel if multiple threads are calling this method. Yeah? So it means that I'm always taking, if you have, for example, a three-dimensional vector, I'm always taking blocks of three from my one-dimensional random number generator. This is really a subtle issue here, yeah? I would like to teach you because um, if you do things in parallel, he will pick elements from the one-dimensional sequence and he will populate the vector. If your one-dimensional sequence is thread safe, so it means that there is no issue by many people calling it, yeah, at the same time, then this can, however, mean that if you run your program again and again, your vector is populated in different order. No? So maybe the first element is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But if it, if it is done in parallel, maybe the first element and the second element are maybe now one, and then the second element is taking it, two, yeah, three, four, five, six. Yeah? So your second element is suddenly two, three, six. The, the second element from the one-dimensional sequence, the third element from the one-dimensional sequence, and the sixth element of the one-dimensional sequence. So this means when you run your program again and again, it scrambles the sequence in higher dimension. So you have to be a little bit careful about this, and this is what it prevents it. This means that I always take the same blocks. If you don't, uh, if you are not so familiar with uh, this programming 
aspect, you can just forget it. And you just see that this here is our little Dargos. Let's try the generation of the random numbers in higher dimension. Yeah, create a new package maybe here yeah, to have the experiment located a little bit separately. Let's call this experiments. And I create here a random number generator 2D experiment. And what I would like to do with you is I would like to sample now a two-dimensional vector. Uh, um, and then I just plot uh, in the scatter the two-dimensional vector. So I would like to sample a vector from 0, 1 to the power of 2. Uh. So um, how many sample points do we like to have? So let's define that. Let's maybe take 1,000. Which uh, one-dimensional random number generator do we would like to have? Yeah, I take maybe my Mersenne Twister. So this is now my random number generator 1D. Yeah, this is Mersenne Twister my pseudo random number generator. Okay, so I have a Mersenne Twister in my library, but maybe I would like to have now my own implementation here. Yeah, maybe I just copy this from our repository. So there is a Mersenne Twister here. If you like to look into this, you see this Mersenne Twister is just using the implementation from the Apache Common Mass yeah, it's just implementing our interface. Uh, it's wrapping the implementation of the Apache Common Mass and um, is uh, wrapping it to implement our interface. So maybe I just use this guy here yeah, and copy it to our uh, random number generators that we have here in our coding session. So now I have a Mersenne Twister here. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I use it with a certain seed. Yeah. Okay. Now I have a one-dimensional sequence. I would like to generate from that a two-dimensional sequence. So I would like to have a random number generator by random vector sequence a random number generator generator from 1D. Okay, so he requires two arguments. Which one dimensional random number generator you would like to use? And what is the dimension? So the dimension is two. Yeah, now I have my random vector, say random vector generator, if you like. Uh, and I would like to plot it. So how many points I'd like to plot? I would like to plot 1,000 points. So I need to store the points, yeah, just for plotting. Okay, this is maybe a detail. You can forget about this, yeah. So I have the X values. I need to store it in some list. And I need the Y values. I need to store it also in some list. Let's import here array list and list and then I can populate these guys so my i runs from zero to number of sample points and I now populate this so I ask for my random vector so this is my random vector generator give me the next element of your vector value sequence, and I populate now the array. So this is the element zero is the X and Y is the element one. Um, now I can plot this, so I have a small helper. 
So create a scatter here, and there is a scatter that can create a scatter out of these two lists from zero to one, having three pixels as the dot. Yeah, let's run this program and have a look how this looks. Yeah, this is now our two-dimensional samples generated from the one-dimensional sequence using our new implementation of this interface of a vector value generator that can generate here yeah, a vector from a one-dimensional sequence. So that looks nice. Maybe I also print here in the title um, the name of this generator. So I can yeah, maybe just call here the two-string method. And in our little wrapper here, I also maybe add a two-string method that tells me which one-dimensional generator was used. Yeah, so which one-dimensional generator was used and what is the dimension? So now I have a small title in my experiment. Let's run this experiment. So you see, I use random number generator from 1D. The one-dimensional one is Mers and Twister with a certain seed, dimension is two. So now it becomes a bit interesting. Let's have our experiment again, but not with Mers and Twister, with the van der Korput sequence. So to um, do this, maybe I move this here to a separate function. I call this function just plot sample points. And it takes the random vector generator as an input. Because then I can reuse this. I do not need to copy it. Okay, and I'll also pass maybe the number of sample points as an argument. Yeah, so now I have a nice function for this generator, plot me, yeah, that many points. And I would like to do the same stuff now with the van der Korput sequence. So my van der Korput sequence is also a random number generator, 1D. Well, let's use base two. Yeah, that's a nice guy. And I can now create my random vector generator, say random vector generator two. Yeah, it's now another one with the van der Korput sequence instead of the Mersenne Twister. And let's have that plotted. So let's run this program. Okay, so now you have these two things here. X, Y, scatter plot. Left is Mersenne Twister. Right is Van der Korput sequence base two. Yeah? So also nicely that our two print methods generate now automatically the title of the implementation that was used. And you see that the van der Korput sequence does not work with this algorithm. Yeah, clearly it does not work because it has too many structure. We have, we have lost this effect that we have an uh, sequence of iid random variables it's no longer a sequence of iid random variables so if i use this algorithm i do not have iid components yeah. clearly if you go to the picture you see the van der Korput sequence starts with one half for the x value and then one over four for the y value and the next one is three over four right so it's 0.75 for the x value, and then it jumps to one over eight, yeah, which is yeah, around here, yeah, 0 0.125. Yeah. And then the next one is one over eight plus one half. Yeah. So that's 0 0.625. Yeah. Okay, that guy is here. Yeah. And then you get that value. So you see you have too much structure and all the points lie on these lines. So 
beware, you cannot use a quasi Monte Carlo sequence to generate samples in higher dimension. You cannot do this. This means for any high dimension, you need a new algorithm that generates a low discrepancy sequence, a quasi Monte Carlo sequence in this dimension. That's why I have now a separate session that we would like to look at low discrepancy sequences in higher dimension. And the analog to the van der Korput sequence is the Horton sequence. And there's only a slight modification now for the Horton sequence. So the modification is that we have a base B van der Korput sequence in every component, but each component has a different base. And the bases are co-primes, yeah? So they have greatest common divisor one, yeah? So they have no common divisor. So BJ, BK have no common divisor. And then the sequence XI, where each component is now the van der Korput sequence, this sequence is called Horton sequence. Of course, the one-dimensional Horton sequence is just the van der Korput sequence. But sometimes people just say Horton sequence also for the one-dimensional one. So here in the script, you find now the algorithm for the Horton sequence, which is actually the algorithm I did for the van der Korput sequence. So maybe I implement now the Horton sequence and repeat my little experiment. So we have a new random number generator here. That's now my Horton sequence. And of course, I like to have my Horton sequence uh, to implement now my random number generator, but not the 1D, the general one. Okay, so he will complain now that I need to implement these two methods. So my Horton sequence has a, a few properties. What are the properties? Well, the dimension is a property, but of course the property is the vector of these bases here. So we have to check for these bases. Yeah, let's have these bases here. So this is now, say, a vector of integers or long integers as you like. Yeah, maybe int is also now enough. A vector of integer. These are the base. Yeah, or if you like, bases. I do not need a separate property for the dimension because the length of this vector already tells me uh, how long it is. Okay. And I also need um, a counter that tells me, okay, what is the next element of my sequence? Yeah. So when I call get next, yeah, that increments the counter. So let's get, generate the constructor. Okay, then let's have our counter. Ah, I have to call it counter. Yeah. So that is my counter. I initialize it maybe to zero. And uh, yeah, that can be final too. Um, and then we return the next uh, Halton number uh, when you call get next. So what is the index? So I ask my counter, okay, what is the current value? And after I have fetched the current value, I increment it. And then I populate my vector. So my vector is now a new vector with the co corresponding dimension. Yeah, the dimension is just the length of the basis vector. And I just populate this. So populate this one by the other with, yeah, what we do now is the ith value is the van der Korput number. So now it 
pays off that our funder corporate sequence has a static method where I can just get funder corporate number. Yeah, add the corresponding index with the corresponding base. So now I ask here basis, the ice element of the base. That is every sequence, every element is a funder corporate sequence with the corresponding index of this counter and just with a different base. Yeah. So then the counter uh, incoherence after you have populated the whole vector. Yeah? So one, one increment for the whole vector, every guy has a different base. The dimension is just the length of the base. There is nothing, nothing to do. Yeah, let's go back to our experiment and repeat now our experiment with the Halton sequence. So I just repeat this here with the Halton sequence. So now I do not need this wrapper here. So I just need the random number generator. Now that's now the Halton sequence. I take a new Halton sequence. Which bases do we use? Yeah, maybe I use base two and base three. They should be co primes. Yeah. And I can now plot the sample points for the Halton sequence. And to have a nice title, maybe also add a two string method here, like we did before. So that will be then used as the title. No? So what do we print in the two string? Maybe just the basis and not the counter. Yeah, let's run now our experiment that creates now, hopefully, three plots. And now we have these nice three plots. You have the unstructured pseudo-random number generator, our mass and twister generating the two-dimensional the wrong method where you use the uh, funder corporate sequence and populate it in two dimension. And now a quasi random number generator in two dimensions, the Horton sequence with base two and three. Okay, so that was uh, my session on random number generation. Let's complete now the script here. So that's the code for the funder corporate and the Horton sequence. You can prove for the Horton sequence that the discrepancy is log n to the power of d divided by n. Yeah. So um, it is still better than one divided by square root of n, but you lose some uh, of the yeah, convergence if you move to higher dimensions. Yeah because you have also these different choices of the bees yeah, and yeah, how they populate the space. Uh, I said it is still better than classical Monte Carlo. And yeah, you think, okay, this is much better than one divided by square root of n. I mean, log doesn't contribute so much, but you have to be a little bit careful here. Um, in practical application, the n doesn't go to infinity. So what is the N in a practical application? Yeah, I often use 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. Maybe you can use 100 million, but at a certain point, yeah, you have limits due to the you know, compute power you have. And have a closer look to when do we have the quasi Monte Carlo convergence rate being better than the classical pseudo random number generator Monte Carlo uh, convergence rate, the stochastic rate. When is this the case? Yeah. So for a practical choice of n. So let's consider now n fixed, which is the case in, in, in applications, and take a look at the dimension. So log n to the power of d divided by n, smaller or equal, one divided by square root of n. Yeah, you multiply just by n, yeah, then you get on the right-hand side the square root, yeah, n divided by square root is just the square root. And on the left-hand side, you just have the logarithm now. Okay, then take the logarithm again, then you get d times the logarithm of the logarithm of n, 
less or equal logarithm of square root of n. So that means that the dimension has to be less than logarithm of square root of n divided by log log of n. Yeah, logarithm of square root of n is one half log n. So you have one half log n divided by log log n. And if you now use a practical choice of n, yeah, say this here is a this here is a 10 million, yeah. So it's a 10 to the power of seven. Yeah? So then yeah, log n is just this uh, seven. Uh, if you now calculate the uh, log n divided by log log n, so this is a 4.1. So if the dimension is smaller or equal 4.1, then you have that your quasi Monte Carlo method looks better. And okay, this is of course not uh, um, a correct estimate here because all we have is just the order of, yeah? so we do not know what is the constant in front. But this gives you maybe some intuition that this advantage is lost very quickly if dimension is high and if the number of sample points is just a practical choice, yeah? Large, but not very large. Okay, keep this maybe, may, maybe in mind, yeah? The classical randomized Monte Carlo method maybe it still has an edge. Just for a reference, a very good quasi-random number generator are the Sobol numbers. Yeah, So the Sobol numbers are also a low discrepancy sequ sequence. So there is a reference here. And um, you can now also find a nice other experiment in our repository where we use um, yeah, a multi-dimensional integration to approximate pi, yeah. Maybe we also do that sometimes later. You can do this in, in parallel, yeah. So this experiment can be found here. That was it for today, thanks. <laughs>